Good morning. Turn in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. We're going to read the rest of the chapter and be reminded as you turn there that this is God's holy word. It is absolutely inerrant, infallible, sufficient, and the only final authority for all that we're supposed to believe and do in our lives. And so be addressed by God as you hear these words of Jesus. Matthew 6, starting in verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word and these words of Jesus. We thank you for their simplicity and their beauty, but also the great conviction that comes with it. And so we pray as we know very well that we think about these things in ways that do not trust in you and do not tell the truth about your fatherly goodness and care. Lord, bring conviction and comfort to us through this teaching. Help me to clarify these words and that our attention would not be adrift by uh, anything else, any of the cares of this world or any of the things that can choke out the fruitfulness of the word from our sinful hearts. But Lord, give us the grace of your Holy Spirit, the illumination of your word, that you would teach us these wonderful things out of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the message today is Seek the Kingdom Over Life Itself. Seek the Kingdom Over Life Itself. Um, One of the the maxims that I repeated over and over again in my first church plant, not because I was trying to come up with clever little maxims, just because it seemed true and I wanted to keep repeating it, and that is that the emphasis in our speech is the gospel that we preach. The emphasis in our speech is the gospel we preach. Not just our speech, but also our action, our activity can sometimes tell a different gospel as well. We can believe the right gospel on paper, but sometimes not believe that same good news in our hearts. And sometimes our noisy hearts and our activity and our sweat and all these different things in life, what we obsess over, what we tend to go to first, what wakes us up in the morning, that that can tell a different gospel to ourselves and a different gospel to the people that see us and that hear our emphasis. But the key word here isn't a single word that we say. It's really an attitude that comes through our words and our activity or our inactivity. Sometimes our inactivity can tell a different gospel. And that attitude and that activity 
That state of mind is called anxiety. The Greek word that is used here for anxiety, merimnao, is not a sudden fear or concern. That wouldn't necessarily be sinful in itself. Not even a worry, but a preoccupation, a distraction, an obsession, a fixation, a constant drumbeat and a constant march. And this sweating, calculating, inner taskmaster. Sometimes we hear about the Pharisee in our heart. But I think sometimes there can be a Pharaoh in our hearts. A taskmaster who lies about God and lies about the activity that we must do by tomorrow or else. And that begins to create an emphasis in our speech, an anti gospel. And so the big idea today, if you get lost at any point throughout this text, come back to this. This is really the doctrine, the truth that Jesus is teaching, and that is that anxiety points souls away from Christ and his kingdom. Now, that seems harsh at first because, of course, I think we could admit, I can admit, we all get anxious. Nevertheless, anxiety points souls away from Christ and And his kingdom. We'll see that in three ways. We'll see that anxiety pursues not the kingdom. Secondly, anxiety lies about God's care. And third, anxiety doesn't work anyway. Now, we're not going to go completely left to right in this text as I just read it. These three concepts are kind of scattered throughout, but I'll show you where they are in the text. Anxiety pursues not the kingdom, anxiety lies about God's care, and anxiety doesn't work anyway. Anyway, let's look at the first point, which is really the biggest and most obvious, that anxiety pursues something, but not the kingdom. And this is really following from last week. We have this truth at the beginning of the passage and at the end of the passage. And first, it's in the very first word. In verse 25, therefore. And you always want to, you never want to skip over that word. It seems like a very simple word, but what it does is connects this part of the text with what came before it. So before you move on to the whole of what Jesus is saying, just remember that this is a continued thought from what we looked at last week, verses 19 through 24. And all that about these two treasures vying for the attention of your soul. These two treasures that are in a tug of war over your heart. And what he's about to say is really an application of that. But what was the punchline of pursuing those treasures of heaven? The punchline of it was that you can't just sit on the fence. You can't just stay neutral. You can't just say, well, I'll have one foot in the kingdom of God and another foot where I'm sort of hedging my bets and I'm going after earthly treasures. He was saying there's a tipping point. You cannot serve two masters. Your love for the one will build in you a hatred for the other. Therefore, and there comes that word. So with that punchline, Therefore, what? Therefore, even the bare necessities can become a kingdom-evacuating obsession. So what was he talking about? He was talking about the right car, the right job, the right status. People look at me. I want to be like that person. I'm going to live forever. All these different things, big things, glitzy, glamorous things that you think of. Now in this passage, he's going to say, I'm talking about air, water, shelter, Clothes on your back. And you're going to be tempted to say, well, that's messed up. Because I don't have an obsession over this car and being like this superstar or anything like that. I just want to breathe. You're saying that God is saying that I'm upset over that, therefore I'm what, an idolater? And that's going to be the temptation. So Jesus isn't talking anymore about stock market investments or your favorite team winning a championship anymore or something that's frivolous or something that's idolatrous in some other way. Now he's talking about the bare necessities, not just a roof over your head, any roof over your head. And so he says in verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So you see this. Do not be anxious about your 
life, your very life, life itself is in the crosshairs. Not only is food and drink and clothing put in the balance, but the whole sum of it that we call life is put in the balance. Your health and the air that you breathe. If you can lose it, and you can, because anything in this life is a thing that you can lose. It's part of this temporal passing away age for us all. And so the psalmist says in Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Why would numbering your days give you a heart of wisdom? It's because we are deluded to think that we'll live forever. Now, on paper, again, everybody knows on paper. Of course, now I know that already, but we don't live like it. We live as if we can put these questions off. Oh, I'll settle my accounts with God later. But we don't realize that God is not lacking in ways, as Jonathan Edwards said in that famous sermon, to take us out of this world. We need to understand that the very day of our death is decreed by God, that we have an appointment with God, that we have an appointment with Christ, and we can't just put these things off and off and off. And so life itself is in the crosshairs, but it's not just in the crosshairs. It's in the balance, just like those treasures from last week. It's in the scales. In other words, there's a tale of two lives here. Jesus isn't saying your life is of no value in the sense that you know, you're not an image of God or anything like that and you didn't take it more seriously. Jesus is going to get you to take it actually more seriously than you were. First, he says, don't be anxious about your life. And so there, life is something that you're giving up. But that's not an end in itself because then he says, is not life more? He's not getting you to downgrade your life. He's getting you to upgrade it by infinity. He's not saying your life is worthless. He's saying the way you thought before makes your life worthless. Trade that in. Exchange that. And so Jesus says elsewhere in John 12, 25, and this is one of those calls to self-denial. Take up your cross and follow me. Hate your life and, and so forth. These radical calls to discipleship in places like Matthew 10 and in Luke 14. But in John's version of that, in John 12, listen carefully. Because self-denial is not an end in itself. That would be Buddhism. The idea of simply dying. Simply losing yourself. Self-annihilation. That's not the way Christianity talks. So John 12, 25, Jesus says, whoever loses his life, sorry, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. What is he doing? He's getting you to trade not real life. He's getting you to trade the counterfeit for real life, for the life that lasts forever. If Matthew's been building this idea from Jesus' teaching that the kingdom of Christ is life itself, the real everlasting life, that's exactly what Matthew's been doing. It's the new world that's bursting onto the scene. If that's what he's been doing with Jesus' teaching. Well, then Jesus is going to plea with us to not get caught up in anything that would distract us from that life. Any counterfeit, any mirage of a so-called real life. And you might say to that, I get that last week. I get how obsessing over my favorite sports team or driving a fancy car or having X amount of money in the bank account, I get how that's a distraction from eternal life. But come on, God, food and drink, air, clothing, how's that in the same category as fancy cars, ideal careers, and all that good stuff that we talked about last time. But remember, when we talked about money, that paper money and those other things in the world are not evil in themselves. That was not the problem that Jesus was aiming at. And so it is here. Food and drink and clothing aren't the problem. You making money and working hard and saving money and sharing those things with others is not the problem. But spending your time obsessing, fixating, and fretting over them, that's the issue. And that does take time. So it's not like you say, well, I have a job, and that takes eight hours. But having anxiety over it, having anxiety over it is what you pretty much do the rest of the day if we have that problem. 
And it's what we do while we're working. And so that's something that does take up time. Fretting over these things. We can't do that and be about the king's business. Jesus isn't saying, you can't have a job and be about the king's business. Give up your job. That, that's not what we find in the New Testament. People do that with Acts 2 all the time. They joined a commune, and they had everything in common. No, it says they met in their houses, which means they still had houses, which means they still had jobs. And you see that throughout the New Testament. So you're sort of tweezering that out of context. No, they still had jobs. They worked hard. They saved money. They shared with people who were in need and all that stuff. So Jesus isn't saying, you can't do those regular things in the world and come and follow me. But he is saying, you can't obsess over that because that will form for you an excuse to not follow me. That will sideline you from the kingdom of Christ. And this is more obviously spelled out at the end of the passage in verse 33, where he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to to you. So before we get to other things that that means, which we will, what's meant just by seek the kingdom? What is this expression? If we're supposed to do it, we should know what it means. Well, there's two main things that this tends to mean if you look throughout the Gospels at the whole of Jesus' teaching. When he talks about pursuing the kingdom, entering the kingdom, all those different things, there's two main things he means. Number one, it means an entrance into the life of the kingdom or conversion to Christ. So think of John 3.3, 3, a very famous passage. Unless you're born again, you cannot see into the kingdom of God. So there, entering the kingdom, pursuing the kingdom is treated like a front door, a window into and a walking into. It's being converted to Christ to begin with. But the second thing it tends to mean is following the rule of that kingdom, following Jesus, conforming to the standards of the kings. And so if you, if you look at all the passages in the Gospels about what seeking the kingdom really means, it means those two things, converting to Christ and conforming to Christ. So have that in your mind. That's what he means by seeking. And that brings up the next question. If that's what seeking the kingdom means, why would that require this particular teaching in chapter 6? Why the stuff about anxiety? Why pit seeking the kingdom against obsessing over all these things? And the answer is this. Because those two things, converting to Christ and conforming to Christ, will get you in trouble in this world. It'll empty your shelves. It'll empty your bank account. It'll at the very least empty you of your friends list. It'll get you in trouble with those easy things in the world. And so that brings about all the temptations to anxiety. That's why the tug of war exists. He says to enter this first. This could mean many things. There are many applications to first. Don't say, I'll serve God later. I've got to do X, Y, and Z first. I've got time. Jonathan Edwards, in preaching a sermon to the youth of his church during the Great Awakening, he preached a sermon called Early Piety is especially acceptable to God. In other words, accept, especially pleasing to God when we offer God the youth of our lives. Here's what he says. He says, those who are pious early dedicate the flower of their life to God. The flower of our life is due to God. The whole of it is due to God, but God especially challenges the prime of life. All that we have, we should give to God. But he is especially pleased when we give our best to him. Our youth is on several accounts the best part of our lives. The nature is in its bloom, farthest from any decay. Then the body is most lively, active, and beautiful. And the powers of the mind are in some respects more sprightly. It is like bringing the first fruits to God. Remember the first fruits from a couple weeks ago. Now, there's application of this to those who are older, but there's certainly application to those who are younger, and they need to hear this too. And so Edwards is saying, and I think it's true, that one of the applications of seek first is to seek early in your life, that God is more glorified when we give him the best of our minds, the best of our body, 
the best of our time and use it for his kingdom. Well, that's anxiety on a collision course with the kingdom. The other two points are a little bit smaller, but they're still important. And the second one is that anxiety lies about God's care. Now, we're forgiven of these sins in Christ. We need to repent of these sins whenever we're aware of them. God has grace for us. Nevertheless, they're still sins, and we need to know from God's law how they're sins and why they're sins. Otherwise, we won't repent for them. The bulk of this passage is where we find some of the most poetic and most familiar expressions even the world knows about these passages from Jesus. And he points in verses 26 through 30 to two objects in nature. And then he makes the same lesser to greater argument about both of those parts of nature. Here are those words, starting in verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? See what he's doing? He's teaching from nature. Jesus isn't afraid of nature, and he wants us to use our reason about things in the world because God has so ordered the world so that everything in the world talks about him. If we don't see that, it's because we were blind in our sin. Nevertheless, he says, look, look at these birds. Then he says, verse 28, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And that challenge especially at the end. That's not for nothing. O you of little faith. There's something about our belief whatever we might say on paper, that is not in line with who God is. In other words, are you anxious about food? Look at how God feeds the birds. Are you anxious about clothes? Look at how God dresses up the flowers. These are animals and plants. You're an image of God. But more than that, if you're a believer in Christ, you're a child of God. You're a son or a daughter of the King. Jesus is saying, think about it. Do you not think that he cares about you and will clothe you and feed you and meet these needs? In other words, what is God like when it comes to valuing plants and animals, human beings in general, and then his own blood-bought children, as Romans 8.32 says, that he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? If he gives us Christ, giving us food is nothing. Giving us clothes is nothing. But there's a lingering suspicion. And Jesus knows that. That's why he's saying this to us. He knows our hearts. And it is actually a suspicion that we have against God. It's that question I brought up earlier. How is this the same thing as the fancy car? How is this? You're going to condemn me because I'm worried about where my next paycheck's going to be. But Jesus is not condemning us. He's speaking to disciples. He's speaking to God's own children. He is speaking as a shepherd to sheep. He understands. And he would settle us down. He would settle our anxious hearts that have missed the whole point and say to us, your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. In other words, part of what he's doing is he's challenging our definition of what we need. I need food, though. But what you really mean by that is you need it by this time, in this amount, in this kind, through this job, for these people, and you're adding and adding and adding and adding and adding. And you're telling God what should be on the menu. And part of what he's doing is challenging us and saying, your father knows what you need. And by the way, you actually don't. Even about these things. So God is not judging you for the bare necessities being the bare necessities. He made them. He made H2O. He made your body with lungs. 
He made your body and knows that you need clothes. He's not judging you for that. But he would have us all grow up as his children to graduate from thinking that staying away from the life of the kingdom is the way to secure these things. I'm, I need to work on Sunday. By the way, the Reformed tradition has an answer for that. It's also very pastoral and loving. It's called works of necessity and works of mercy. And I've talked to many people through the years. People are nurses. People are cops. People are soldiers. It's a work of necessity. But what I tell people is, as soon as you can, order and structure your life as much as, much as you can to be in God's house for his means of grace. But that's a work of necessity. And he knows that. And Jesus said that about the Sabbath. In Mark 2, 27, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He's, this is a kind gift to us. It's not a, this chain around our neck. And there's also works of mercy. You see an ox in a ditch or the modern version of that, somebody blows a tire or something on a Sunday. You miss church for that. You're not judged for that. Any more than Jesus when he was healing on the Sabbath. So God is not judging you for these things. But what he is doing is raising our attention for whoever needs to hear it, and we all need to hear it in some area of life or another, that staying away from the kingdom, whether with my time or my talent or my treasure, is not how I'm going to get food and oxygen. and That's not the answer. He will add these things to you. He will provide for you if you follow him. In that same verse, verse 32, it starts with another indication that you are a child of God where he says, verse 32, for the Gentiles seek after these things. And here what he's doing is he's making another division between God's people. Gentiles was a word that was used not simply for non-Jews, but as things drift to the New Testament, the word Gentile started to be used simply for outsiders because that's kind of the impression in the Old Testament. You were either Jew or you were a non-Jew. You were not people of God. And so in the New Testament, the word Gentiles is used for simply unbelievers, outsiders, not people of God. So what's Jesus saying? You're not thinking like a Christian. He's not saying, if you've ever struggled with this, well, then you're not really a Christian. That's not what he's saying. But he is saying, that is not thinking like a Christian. The gen- In other words, the Gentiles think like that. I know perfectly well that you need these things. But making things about those things is how unbelievers think. It is an unbiblical way to, in this case, as we're going to see, to waste your life. The Gentiles do that. In that same verse 32, he he says that your father knows you need this and the Gentiles seek after these things. So he's bringing conviction to us. Now, I Again, we have to, this, there's, there's good news here. He is telling us this as a shepherd. He is lovingly, gently coming to us in a thing that we all struggle with. This is not about condemnation, but it is about maturity. There is a conviction. Our Father does mean to take care of us. There are comforting words here, but there is also conviction. And the truth of the matter is, the irony is, we're already the ones condemning ourselves. Why do we have anxiety? I've got to get this done before this, or else, how how do you finish the sentence? You're your own taskmaster. You're your own devil. You're your own pharaoh. You're your own chains. But God does not demand that of you by yesterday and all these different things, or else. Or else what? Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You're the one, if you have anxiety, who is binding yourself in legalism and who is not accepting God's grace. I mentioned that anxiety is an inner taskmaster. It is the devil who demands more of my toil in order to escape my chains. The voice of anxiety tells me that God will not take care of me if I leave off the devil's plantation and I come into the Father's house. And that brings up the last point, and it's really the shortest, and it's going to seem mean as well. But sometimes God gives us a little tough love, just a little shot, in the middle of this passage, and this third point is saying that anxiety doesn't work anyway. And it might be the easiest part of this passage to miss because it's only one little part, verse 27. But Jesus adds these words for practical importance. While you're thinking about all that, 
Think about this too. He says, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Show me somebody who is anxious, and I'll show you somebody who is not working. Show me to somebody who says, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I'll show you somebody who, is, who needs to get back to work. That's actually not working. But you take it as a set of moral seriousness. No, we, we're going we're to take this seriously. But when you do that, you're not doing your work with joy and peace. And therefore, you're going to burn out. And you're going to burn out everybody else around you. Anxiety doesn't work. And so for everything else here that may be difficult to accept, Jesus is saying, while you're chewing on that, just know this. Anxiety has never worked. Not one ounce of anxiety has ever lifted a finger to remove the obstacle that the person was so anxious about. And that makes anxiety the most worthless of human passions. Now, I didn't say it's unexplainable. It's perfectly natural. But again, that's why Jesus brings it up, because we all do suffer from it. This is not just some self-help guru saying to us, you know, most of the things you worry about, it's not going to happen anyway. Well, that might be true about most things, but there are some things in life that are actually worse than you think. And Jesus is not condemning any old kind of fear. However, Argue the best doomsday scenario you can possibly think of, and it will still be true that anxiety is the enemy of effective, God-honoring activity. This is the meaning, by the way, of the words in Proverbs 31, the Proverbs 31 woman. There's a lot of things on that list. One of the things that I think people, as I hear people reading it and that confuses them the most, she laughs at the time to come, verse 25. Did you ever just stop and think, what does that mean? (laughs) What is she, like, crazy? Like, she's doing so much hard work, she drove herself mad, and and, and she laughed. No, that's not the point. She's not laughing like Sarah laughed. She's not laughing like that kind of laughter. She's confident. She's confident in the God who she serves. All that industry, all that activity, not a hint of anxiety. And that's what's meant by laughing at the time to come. Note also an important difference between the objects of anxiety and then genuine objects of fear. I said Jesus is not teaching that any object of fear should not make you fear. For example, later in this gospel, in chapter 10, verse 28, he says, Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. You should fear God. But in fearing God, you lose the fear of other things. Anxiety will sideline you in the kingdom. And the anxiety that does that is not just a good fear, because you're supposed to have that fear of God. The anxiety that will sideline you in the kingdom is a preoccupation with the things of this world as if they could last treating the things in this world as if they were life itself. Eternal judgment really does last. The judge of it, God, really is to be feared. But the details of our exact time, the exact method of our income, the exact amount in our savings, the exact networking that we do, all of that is passing away. So do be about that business. Do the math, shake the hands, get some sleep, and get back to work in the kingdom because anxiety will never work. So those are the three things about anxiety that this text teaches us. How do we apply this to our lives? Hopefully, in some conviction over this, you can see some senses that we should repent, for one thing, wherever we experience that. But this passage is for our instruction. Sinful anxiety here does not condemn planning. You may be thinking about this, especially in light of the way the world is right now. And you may think to yourself, okay, so planning's bad because planning is for a, a rainy day or like a monsoon rainy day brought about by certain world leaders that I don't trust really well right now, so I want to plan. And you might be thinking about that, so is planning 
the same thing as this sinful kind of anxiety? And the answer is not necessarily. There is a difference between preoccupation with the world and occupation in the world. Jesus prays in John 17, 15 that we would be left in the world. He does not remove us from occupation with the world. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 4.11, work with your hands. You know, there's something about God's glory at stake in you working with your hands. The Proverbs are filled with the wisdom of saving and thrift and drawing boundaries between the right kind of people and the wrong kind of people. None of that is what Jesus means by this sinful anxiety. And so the question, can I prepare for X, whatever that is, Joseph did in Genesis. I give you other examples, but Joseph is just one example. Now, there's a bad example. The man who's wicked in Luke's gospel in the parable, who is storing up those things for himself. So Joseph is storing. This guy's storing. Joseph is called righteous for that. This man is wicked. And God says, you fool. This very night, your life is demanded of you. And whose things will those be? So what makes the difference? Well, here's one. Joseph was all about the kingdom of God. This man was hoarding for himself. This man was treating these things as if they could make him live forever and as if he was the center of life and taking care of himself. Joseph was taking care of the family of God. And by the way, he even traded with the nations as they all came during this famine for all the stuff that he had stored up. So planning, if it's for all the things that God commands in his law anyway, to love other people and so forth, is not the same thing as this kind of anxiety. That's just one thing. This passage is for our exhortation. Now, I don't personally believe that the Lord's purpose here is to give us some full understanding of anxiety. It's, it's, this text is not going to answer for us all the questions. What are the causes of anxiety? Um, is anxiety a sin? And I think we answered some of those things. Uh, how do I get rid of anxiety? Those are questions I think that the Bible does have very good and important answers for us. But getting our whole head and our hearts wrapped around that is not quite the point of Jesus' teaching here. He's doing something else. We do need to keep in mind that Jesus was teaching this to his disciples. So the message here is not one of immediate perfectionism. Again, it is not... I struggle with that. Well, guess what? I do too. Therefore, I'm not a real Christian. As I said, that is, that's not Jesus' heart for us here. But there are gentle introductions to inconvenient truths. As a loving, good, gentle shepherd, he gives us some jagged-edged pills. And this is one of them. And he is making us deal in the mirror of his word with the depths of of our hearts where we don't want to be about his business. But he's doing it in a way that's gentle. And so the psalmist says, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. But here's the thing, even creatures of the dust need to know to not cling to the dust because that'll take you out of the kingdom. This passage finally is for our consolation. There's gospel in this passage. In these words, seek First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, there is gospel. One more time to compare the taskmaster of anxiety to our gracious father who sent his son as the king to bring us home. Having assured us of his father's care, he says, seek first his kingdom. Not just the kingdom's great work first, which is true, and then he'll give you the food and the clothing and all that stuff. That's true. But he adds and his righteousness. What's that about? It's true, as I said before, that righteousness several times in the Gospels means practical righteousness. Righteousness lived out. Yes, we're justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. We pursue holiness. So there's a practical righteousness, and we've already seen that in Matthew's Gospel. But here, there is a righteousness that comes first. There's a righteousness that comes at the entry of his kingdom, at the front door and the foundation of his house. And so throughout the Gospels, this entry into the kingdom tends to mean to be born again, to be converted to Christ. 
And so perhaps if we have the courage to leave behind the devil's chains of anxiety and to come into the Father's house, we might ask, so am I exchanging worldly works for doing nothing at all? God saves us by his grace. But we see throughout Matthew's gospel and elsewhere that that's not the case. But that's actually great news. Because verse 33 whispers to us that it's not just hang out with Christ and I'll make sure that you're fed and clothed. But there's a righteousness that comes for, And that this verse is whispering to us, I believe, that justification comes before sanctification. That there's a righteousness that comes at the front door. And it is His righteousness. Here He is not speaking of your righteousness that you follow up with, that you prove out that you're a Christian. But here He speaks of His righteousness. You and I will fall short. We'll fail every day at exactly this thing. But if Christ's righteousness is the very ground under our feet, then we can never fall out of his hands. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And we can never fall out of his kingdom if his righteousness comes first. Let's pray. Father, we ask you now that you continue to teach us what it means to have the righteousness of your son, to pursue the kind of kingdom where your son, the king, gives us the very robes of his righteousness which he earned and we did not earn. Help us, Lord, to trust in him for that and to trust in you to give to us what you will in this life to give up our grasp on what we think we need and to hear from you and to continue to learn more from you, from your word, what you know that we need. We thank you for this, these words of comfort and conviction. We pray that we would live it out in the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as we uh, get ready to take the Lord's Supper, do think about that. This is a righteousness that comes first. It comes before any of the things we do in church. We talk about two sacraments in the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. This is the Lord's Supper. It is a gospel sign. It's something that points to what He did for us. There's none of us who could stand or sit here on our own two feet, on the ground of our own righteousness, on how we did this week or how we did this very day. Well, I'll come to this table, thank you, Lord, because of what I did. And of course, we are called to examine ourselves, to repent of any sins that we have, and we need to do that. But we don't come to his table because we qualify in what we've done to come to his table. These are his emblems and his tokens of his grace and how he has provided for us. He's providing these things for us to point to his son. So our job is to come and to take him at his word, to believe in his promises, that he is our righteousness, not because of works done by us in righteousness. That's the verse we read in our confession time in Titus, but because of his great mercy. So, if you are a believer in Christ, this is for you. You don't have to be a member of this church, but you do have to be a believer in Christ to participate. And so we ask if you are not a believer, just to sit back and to contemplate these things and to pray to God, to cry out to Him, to ask Him for the gift of repentance and faith.